Hello there, this is Jude Socrates. Welcome to today's video, part of my series on infinite series. And today we are actually going to introduce the main character of this video series, which is, no pun intended, the infinite series. So we are basically going to cover sections 2A and 2B of my textbook. And again, for those who are not my students, you can download a copy of this PDF um, in the video description uh, via Dropbox. So today we are going to look at what is uh, an infinite series, how do you write an infinite series, its notation, what are the partial sums of an infinite series, and we are going to look at two uh, particular kinds of infinite series, namely geometric series and telescoping series, where we will actually be able to find the exact sum of the, these kinds of series. This is not always going to be possible, but more on that later on. All right, but before we go to section 2a, I thought, well, let's start with a covered page of part two of my textbook. So we're going to be talking about infinite series, and in particular, we will start off with geometric series. But there are times when we will not be able to find the exact sum of an infinite series. However, one important question which we will almost always be able to answer is, does the series converge or diverge? So we heard those terms before when we talked about infinite sequences. So today we will also, of course, define what it means for an infinite series to converge or to diverge, whether that's diverge to infinity or negative infinity or simply diverge. So to do that, we will have these seven tests at our disposal. And let me give you a little preview of them. Uh, the divergence test could work on just about any kind of infinite series when applicable. But the next three tests, the integral test, ordinary comparison test, and limit comparison test, they can only work when the terms of the series are always positive or zero. In our previous videos, we saw examples of geometric sequences uh, where the R is negative. So in that case, the terms alternate from positive to negative, back to positive, negative, and so on. Those are examples of what are called infinite sequences, and we can use them to build, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> those are examples of what are called alternating sequences, and we can use them to build alternating series. So the alternating series test will only work for those kinds of alternating sequences. Uh, and the last two tests will work on all kinds of uh, series, positive or negative, some better than others. Um, and they will allow us to decide whether our series is actually a good kind of an infinite series, namely absolutely convergent seek series, or um, perhaps they're only conditionally convergent. So uh, there will be a distinction between these two kinds of convergence for infinite series. And you might ask, well, well, why are we doing that? Well, it's because um, one of these series is better than another, since if we rearrange the terms of the series, we will still always get the exact same sum. And you might say, well, well wait a minute, if you add two numbers together, you're always going to get the same answer. But as we're about to see, in an infinite series, as the term implies, we are sort of adding an infinite number of terms. Not exactly uh, correct mathematically, as we're about to see. So let's take a look at the definitions and notations. Onwards to section 2a. So first of all, how do we write out an infinite series? We start off with an infinite sequence. So we start, we saw this notation in our first video. From this sequence, we will convert it to an infinite series with a summation symbol, which we have seen in basic calculus, of course, when we construct the definite integral. So we will take the summation from n equals zero to infinity, which is the range uh, under which our index uh, assumes its values. And we will have the terms a sub n. Okay, so from the sequence notation, 
we will convert now to a series notation summation n equals zero to infinity of a sub n. So that is how you pronounce that symbol. Now, if your sequence starts at n equals k instead, slight modification, we will go from summation n equals k to infinity of a sub n. Okay, so notice that the subscript here n is the index here on the left side of this notation. Uh, for those in computer science, you can think of n as the counter of a for loop. All right, so we know that notation, what does it mean? What is the meaning of an infinite series? Well, to understand an infinite series, we are going to construct another sequence based on the terms a sub n of our infinite series, which of course forms a sequence. So the zeroth partial sum, s sub o, is simply the zeroth term of our sequence. Just copy it out. That is the zeroth partial sum. What is the first partial sum S1? You add the next term, which in this case would be A sub 1. So to A sub 0, we will add A sub 1. What is the second partial sum? To the current partial sum S1, we will add A sub 2. So in general, we can write Sn as a sub 0 plus a sub 1 all the way up to a sub n, or in summation notation, that is summation k equals 0 to n of a sub k. So notice the difference between this notation and the one I just showed you, which is still up here. We have n equals 0 to infinity a sub n, but this is only n equals 0 to, uh, I'm sorry, k equals 0 to n of a sub k right? So I am using a different index to denote our partial sum. You can't say n equals 0 to n a sub n. That doesn't make any sense, okay? So you need another letter, k, summation k equals 0 to n of a sub k. And written out, this is what it means. We call s sub n the nth partial sum of the sequence, or the nth partial sum of the infinite series, summation n equals 0 to infinity of a sub n. All right? So we're going to lose uh, this as our sort of training wheels. We're going to start with the infinite series notation, and then we will construct the partial sums of that infinite series. Right? So in our previous video, we talked about recursive sequences. So we can also define the partial sums of an infinite series recursively, right? We saw that S sub 0 is simply a 0. But if you want S sub n, you want to add all the terms as to A sub n. However, if you stop at A sub n minus 1, that is simply S sub n minus 1, okay? So from the previous partial sum S sub n minus 1, we simply add the next term which is a sub n, right? So in other words, we can define uh, sk to be a sub k if your series starts at a sub k. And then the partial sum s sub n is the previous, previous partial sum s sub n minus 1 plus the next term in the series, which is a sub n. Okay, so let's go to our workroom and let's see an example of what is called a geometric sequence and a geometric series. All right, so in our first video, we saw geometric sequences, which look like r to the power n, where r is a real number, and we usually um, uh, not allow 0 or 1 to be our common ratio r. They make very boring geometric sequences. So our base here is r. I'm sorry, our r is negative 3 fifths, a little hard to say. So let's take a look at the first few terms and partial sums of our infinite series, right? So when n equals 0, start with n equals 0. So a sub 0 uh, is simply minus 3 fifths to the 0, which is, of course, just 1. Okay, so s sub 0 is simply 1. 
the zeroth term of this geometric sequence. Now, when n equals 1, a sub 1 is the r, which is negative 3 fifths. Okay? So, s sub 1, we take the previous partial sum, which is 1, and we add a sub 1, which is negative 3 fifths. Okay? So, I am emphasizing that we are adding negative 3 fifths, which of course means we're subtracting 3 fifths. So, we're going to get 2 fifths as our first partial sum. Next, n equals 2. So this time, a sub 2 is negative 3 fifths squared, which is 9 over 25, positive 9 over 25. So s sub 2 is the previous partial sum, which is 2 fifths. And we add the next term, which is 9 over 25. Okay, so that is 10 plus 9 or 19 over 25. All right, one more. When n equals 3, then a sub 3 is negative 3 fifths cubed, so it will be a negative number, negative 27 divided by 125. So s sub 3 is now the current partial sum, 19 over 25, and we will add negative 25 over 125, plus minus 25 over 125. So that's 19 times 5, what is that? Uh, 95 minus 25, but we have maple to make sure. 14 over 25, ah, so it actually reduces. Okay. So let's now go to GeoGebra. Um, in the last video, we learned how to construct a spreadsheet in order to more efficiently compute the terms of a recursive sequence. So we're going to do the same thing with this geometric series. So in the last video, uh, I started with the welcome screen for GeoGebra, where you can immediately access the spreadsheet uh, feature. But I wanted to show you today that you can also do that anytime within GeoGebra by going to this waffle and then going to view and selecting spreadsheet. Okay, so there's a spreadsheet. This time it appears on the right side of our screen. All right, so in today's uh, example, our uh, subscript starts at zero instead of one. So our first column will have uh, the numbers 0, 1, 2, and so on. And reminder, to construct this column, you simply add 1 to that previous term, which is a sub 1. And that will give you the 1. And remember this, go to the lower right corner and then drag it down. Let's go up to 12. All right, so there's, there you go, 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 11, which is, of course, on the, th on the 12th row. Okay, so our 0 term was a 1, um, negative 3 fifths to the power 0. But let's think about this recursively. In a geometric sequence, we simply keep multiplying by r. So the r in this example, it's negative 3 fifths. We will multiply that to b sub 1. We're in column b. So negative 3 fifths times b sub 1. Okay, so there you go. It's coming out as a decimal. Negative 3 fifths or negative 0.6. Okay, we only went up to a sub 3 in our workroom. But now that we have this, we can drag it down. Voila! So those are the future terms of our geometric sequence. Okay, let's give it a little bit more room because I, I selected uh, 10 decimal places. Right? So as we can see, it is alternating. Positive 1, negative 0 0.6, positive 0 0.36, and so on. Minus, plus, minus, plus, and so on. Okay, so now let's construct a column for the partial sums. Okay? So the zeroth partial sum is simply the zeroth term 
which is in B sub 1. So we simply write B sub 1 for that entry. Now, how do we get the next partial sum? To C sub 1, I'm sorry, uh, yes, uh, to C1, we are going to add B2, right? So we want C1 here plus B2. C1 plus B2. All right, so 1 minus 0.6 is uh, 0.4, 2 fifths, which we got as our uh, first partial sum. So with that, I'm going to keep my fingers crossed and I am going to drag that lower right corner down and hopefully we'll get the same answers as we did in our workroom. I would hope so. All right, so there we go. Those are the partial sums of our infinite series up to the uh, 11th partial sum. Okay, I said 11th, not 12th, because our sequence starts at zero. The terms start at a sub zero, r to the power zero. Okay, so as you can see, it, it pretty much looks like um, this, the sequence, this new sequence of partial sums is converging. All right, so we saw the concept of a converged sequence in the first video of this video series and it looks like yeah the numbers are are not changing that much so we start with the sequence which is negative three-fifths to the power n but we keep adding to the partial sums the next term of our sequence right so it looks like it converges let's make a picture right so in the columns, we are going to graph the sequence. So we are going to graph uh, in the x coordinate will be a sub 1, and in the y coordinate, we will have b sub 1. Okay, so those are the terms of our sequence. And let me get out of the way here. Woo! Okay, so there you go. We get d1 over there. But we are going to graph all the points. Aha! So we get all of these beautiful terms in our uh, infinite sequence, okay? but only up to um, a sub 11. Okay, so we're going to do something similar in column E. We are going to plot um, a1 as well, uh, but this time we will plot c1 which contains the partial sum, which is, of course, the same uh, value that we got in B sub 1. Okay, so yeah, it kind of looks weird because it's trying to write B1 and D1 at the same time there. Again, take the uh, lower right corner and drag down. Okay, so those are the points um, corresponding to the... Um, the partial sums, which are found in column C. So let's see, can we stretch this out a little bit? Yeah, there we go. And, uh, oh, you know what? Let's, um, yeah, let's make this a little bit bigger. So let's zoom in. So as you can see, all right, the, the sequence, D1, D2, D3, D4, we saw this happen in our first video. It's an alternating sequence, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, okay? And the limit is zero. And we can still see that over here. The terms of the geometric sequence are getting close to zero. That's a very small number. But when you add them up together, let's move this a little bit to the left so we can see the partial sums. That's not getting close to zero. But it looks like it is getting close, they are getting close to a certain number, which is approximately 0.6 to 3, uh, 6, 4, maybe. Okay? So as we can see from these dots where the E's are, uh, you are 
uh, it's not monotonic. We saw that word uh, earlier because the original sequence is not monotonic. So it goes down, goes up, goes down, goes up, and so on. Uh, because we're adding and subtracting, adding and subtracting, and so on, right? So the mystery that we are going to solve in a few minutes is, okay, what is the limit of this sequence of partial sums? Can we find its exact value? All right, so we are now going to find the limit of these partial sums, which means the exact sum of this geometric series. So we said that Sn is A0 up to An. We're going to take A0 and we're going to keep adding until we get A sub N. So in our case, we want 1 plus negative 3 fifths plus negative 3 fifths squared. And we're going to keep going we're going to keep going until we get to r to the n, but for emphasis, this is our r. We want to go up to n minus 1 and one more term to the power n. Okay, so I just want to emphasize that right before negative 3 fifths to the n, we have the power negative 3, 3 fifths to the power n minus 1. Okay, so uh, let me make a copy of this because I want to remove the definition that appears here. Okay, so let's simplify it to that. I want to be able to compute this without having to add n numbers. Okay, imagine if you want S sub 100, you're actually going to add together on the calculator 100 terms. Okay, there's a better way to do it. Here's why. We said that to get the next term, you simply multiply the previous term by another three-fifths, right? So let's do that to both sides of this equation. I will, whoops, wrong, copy, paste. This guy, I will multiply the left side by negative three-fifths and the right side also by negative three-fifths. So I will take this, multiply that on the right side as well, and I'm going to multiply everything on the right side by negative three-fifths, okay? But if you expand that out, what's going to happen? Negative three-fifths times one is simply negative three-fifths, but negative three-fifths times negative three-fifths is negative three-fifths squared, so that's this second term over here, and then what will happen when you multiply to negative three-fifths to negative three-fifths squared? Now you're gonna get a cubed. So you're going to get plus negative three-fifths cubed. We're gonna keep going. If you multiply negative three-fifths to negative three-fifths to the n minus one, the minus one and the power one here will cancel out. You will get this last term negative three-fifths to the power n. So let me put the ellipsis out. So the, so far we have up to here, but there's one more. We are going to multiply negative three-fifths to negative three-fifths to the n. So that last term will turn into negative three-fifths to the power n plus one. Hmm. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, so now check it out. Uh, once again, let me copy this and I will erase the middle part so we get to the good part over here. All right, and let's compare that to what we have over here. All right, we are getting the same terms except uh, this has a one, these two are the same, these two are the same, these two are the same. This one is by itself, okay? So this term does not appear in the original equation because it only goes up to n for s of n. Okay, 
So what's the clever thing to do? We can make these pairs cancel each other out by subtracting this side from this side of the two equations. Okay, so we're going to take this equation and we're going to subtract this equation. And by that I mean we will subtract the corresponding sides. So from the left side, we will subtract negative 3 fifths times Sn. And from the right side, we will subtract quantity this sum. Whoops, excuse me. Judge Hebron, I'm sorry, Maple did not like that. Let me try to do that more. Okay, there you go. My fingers must have slipped. Okay, so if you do that, the only survivors will be one, because there's a one here and there is no one over here. The minus three fifths cancel and so on, all the way up to minus three fifths to the end. But this survives. We are subtracting though, so careful, that's one minus negative three-fifths to the power n plus one. Okay, so there you go. On the left side, okay, so let's keep working on this because we now have Sn appearing twice here, but we can factor it out. We get one minus negative three-fifths. Okay, and there's a one over there. It's not zero, it's one. Where did that one come from? Because Sn is Sn times one. Okay, just in case you forgot, where is that one coming from? Okay, so that's our left side. And on the right side, we get this. All right, so we get a nice formula for Sn. Sn is simply the fraction where this is the numerator, 1 minus negative 3 fifths to the n plus 1, divided by 1 minus negative 3 fifths in the denominator. Okay, so what are we going to do? This Sn is simply another sequence, right? We created a sequence of partial sums using the geometric sequence. So we can take the limit, okay? What is the limit of this fraction as n goes to infinity? Well, we saw this when we talked about geometric sequences. When the r is between negative 1 and positive 1 exclusively, you're not allowed to plug in negative 1 or positive 1, that limit as n goes to infinity is 0. And we saw this in the spreadsheet, in the graph, right? The terms of the sequence are getting closer and closer to zero. So I'm going to use the arrow notation for limit. That converges to the fraction where you simply get one minus zero in the numerator. I will do that for emphasis. In the denominator, there is no m. So we get one plus three fifths, okay? So what is that? Uh, 8 over 5. So that limit is 5 over 8. What is 5 over 8? It is approximately 0.625. Oh, okay. So uh, yeah, let's go back to our spreadsheet and check that that is a reasonable answer. Oh, there you are, 0.6236. Oh so yes, 0.625 is indeed a most reasonable answer. Yahoo! All right, so now that we got our hands dirty, we can formalize what exactly does an infinite series do. So just like for infinite sequences, we can say the same four conclusions for an infinite series because from the infinite series, we form the partial sums of the infinite series, which form a sequence. And because it's a sequence, we can say something about it using the same four conclusions that we have in, I believe, section 1a. Okay, so there are four possibilities. The sequence of partial sums Sn converges to a limit S, which is just an ordinary real number. We say in this case that the infinite series is converges 
convergent rather, and that it converges to this limit s. We write this as summation of n equals 0 to infinity of a sub n is equal to s. And we refer to s as the exact sum of the series. So just like convergent sequences, convergent series are the good kind of series, right? Everything else is bad. It is possible that the sequence of partial sums diverges to infinity. In other words, the partial sums get bigger and bigger and bigger. bigger. Simple example. If a sub n is simply n, okay, what is 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4? Uh, yeah, they're just getting bigger and bigger without bound. That infinite series diverges to infinity. Okay, so similarly, the partial sums could diverge to negative infinity. And in this case, we write that summation n equals 0 to infinity of a sub n diverges or has limit negative infinity. If the series does not do any of the categories uh, above from 1 to 3, then we say simply that the infinite series is divergent or the series divergent. And of course, they are the worst kind of series, although 2 and 3 are also pretty bad as they are. All right, so we can now generalize what happened to our uh, geometric series where our common ratio was negative three-fifths. Um, this is what we did. Okay, so we started out by writing S sub n. It was one plus negative three-fifths, negative three-fifths squared, all the way to negative three-fifths to the power n. Okay, so this time we're just going to write r. And reminder that right before r to the n, we have r to the n minus one. What did we do? Multiply both sides of this equation by r. So we have r times s sub n. r sub 0 becomes r to the 1. I'm sorry, r to the 0 becomes r to the 1. r to the 1 becomes r to the 2, and so on. They all, all the exponents go up by 1. So r to the n minus 1 becomes r to the n. r to the n becomes r to the n plus 1. And just for emphasis, right before r to the n will again appear r to the n minus 1. Right, so when we subtract uh, the left sides of equation of the two equations, we will get S n minus R S n, which we can factor out again. There's a one there, not a zero. One minus R times S n, and that R to the zero survives. The minus R to the n plus one survives. Looks familiar. We had one minus negative three fifths to the n plus one in the workroom. Okay. And in the denominator, we had 1 minus negative 3 fifths. Okay, so uh, when does this have a limit of 0? So back in section uh, 1a, I believe, we said that the geometric sequence converges uh, to a limit if and only if, oh, it's 1b, um, if and only if the absolute value of the common ratio r is smaller than one. And we don't allow zero, of course, because um, yeah, that's a boring sequence. And when that, that does happen, the limit is equal to zero. And so the numerator, the only survivor will be the one, and we get one minus r. Okay, so to summarize, our geometric series converges if the common ratio is uh, between negative 1 and 1, basically. And if so, its exact sum is 1 over 1 minus r. If r is bigger than 1, uh, then what did we say? The terms of the geometric series sequence just get bigger and bigger. And so if you keep adding them together, <laughs> the partial sums also just get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that diverges to plus infinity. Now, if r is less than or equal to negative 1, though, so remember it's alternating, but uh, the positive terms might be going this, will be going this way, the negative terms will be going this way, okay? So when you start adding them up together, uh, yeah, the, that resulting sequence is not going to converge. Neither will it diverge to infinity or negative infinity. So we will say that it simply diverges. Okay. 
So um, for our final example, we're going to look at what is called a telescoping series. So this is covered in section 2B of our textbook. Okay, so let's find the first few partial sums, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get Maple to help us out because we are going to plug in 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on into the terms of the sequence. So we'll start with n equals 1. And I will click equals over here, and we're going to get 1.5. Okay, so of course, um, uh, n equals 1 is not a very big number, so we can verify it by hand. When n is 1, we're going to get 9 in the numerator, and then you get 1 times 2 times 3, which is 6. Whoops, not 96, but 9 over 6. Okay, so that is the first term of our telescoping series. And we're going to find out in a minute why it's called a telescoping series. n equals 2. Plug in 2, so you're going to get 14 over something, 2 times 3 times 4. So we're going to get, ooh, 0.583. Okay? So we can start building the partial sums. Okay, so S1, the first partial sum, is A sub 1, our first term here. 9 over 6, which is 1.5. I'll use the decimal. Okay? And S sub 2 is our 1.5 plus 0.58. All right. And we get 2.08. All right. So next, what happens when you plug in 3? Change the 2 to a 3. And we get 0 0.316. So S3, you take the last partial sum, 2.083333, and we add 0 0.316666. Ooh, maybe something nice will happen. Yeah, so it's approximately 2.4. Okay. So, yeah, partial sums go from 0.58, uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, from 1.5 to 2.08 to 2.4. Hmm, didn't change much. Let's do a couple more. Let's do 4 and 5. Okay, so change that to a 4. And we get, ooh, 0.2. So S4 is 2.4 plus 0.2. And we get, what, 2.6-ish. Okay. All right. Well, um, now, while we are in Maple, I can also show you that Maple might not be able to give us the sum of the series, but it will give us partial sums because all we have to do is change that infinity to an actual integer. Okay, so let's see if we add up the first 10 terms of that sequence. What are we going to get? 3.068. Ooh, so there's, that's quite a jump from there. Hmm. Okay, let's go to 100. Change infinity to 100. And what do we get? 3.45. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah, after we do this example, I want to go back to um, GeoGebra and show you how to at least get these partial sums without having to graph them. Okay, so what we're going to do next is um, we're going to find the exact value of this sum, right? So we have this infinite series over here. How are we going to do that? What could we possibly do? Hmm. We are going to perform a partial fraction decomposition. And we will use that decomposition to find the general formula for the partial sums. And in so doing, we will be able to find the exact sum of this telescoping series. Okay. So, you remember how to do this? We want this to be equal to a decomposition of several fractions, okay? So these are all linear factors, and they're distinct, no squares, 
no irreducible quadratics, nastiness. So we will have a denominator of n, a denominator of n plus 1, and a denominator of n plus 2. Okay, so I hope you remember how to do that. If you this is completely foreign to you, maybe you're not one of my students, you made it this far to the video. Uh, I have a video on uh, rational functions and partial fractions, um, also on my channel, of course. So we want to solve the numerators for, uh, we, want, we want to solve for a, b, and c. So we clear the denominators. We will multiply both sides by n, n plus 1, n plus 2. All the denominators will go away. For a, the survivors are n plus 1 and n plus 2. For b, the denominate the survivors are n and n plus 2. So let me just erase the n plus 1 here. And for c, the survivors are n and n plus 1. Okay, so we have three nice numbers that we can plug in. Uh, let's start with um, let's start with zero. So we'll get 4 equals, the survivors are this, so 1 times 2, 2a, and the rest are 0. So a equals 2. Okay, so now n equals negative 1. So we get negative 5 plus 4 equals negative 1. And on the right side, the survivors are, no, you die, this one survives b times negative 1 times negative 1 plus 2 is positive 1. Okay, so uh, negative 1 on both sides, so b equals positive 1. Okay, last one, n equals negative 2. So we get uh, negative 10 plus 4 is negative 6. And on the right side, who survives? Uh, no, that's zero, that's zero. The C survives. Better because we already have the N, B. So N is negative two. And then negative two plus one is negative one. Okay, so that is positive two, two C. So C is negative three. Okay, so we have our decomposition. This is A is 2, uh, B is 1, and C is negative 3. Okay. So, uh, how is this going to help? How is this going to help? All right. Here's what we're going to do. We are going to recompute the terms of the sequence starting with a sub 1. But this time, we're not going to use the original expression, the 5n plus 4 over blah, blah, blah. Okay, We're going to use this decomposition by replacing the n with 1. Okay, So it's going to be 2 over 1, 1 over 1 plus 1, minus 3 over 1 plus 2. Okay, see what's going on here? So we're going to get 2 plus 1 over 2, 1 over 2 over here, and minus 3 over 3. Now you're going to say that's just equal to 1. But I am going to be stubborn and not simplify it. I'm going to write it as minus 3 over 3. Okay? All right. And like I've done before, let me uh, delete the middle uh, expression here. Let's go straight to the good stuff. Okay, so that's a sub 1. Now what about a sub 2? Okay, so this is going to be 2, 3, and 4. 2, 2 plus 1, 2 plus 2, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy that. And I'm going to change this to a 2 and this to a 3. 
and this still 4. Okay, and furthermore, I'm going to push it to the right. Okay, I'm doing that because I want you to see a pattern starting to form. And let's put the minus here in front. There we go, it looks better that way. Hmm, plus, plus, minus, plus, plus, minus. Okay, couple more. What is a sub 3? So you will now get 3, 4, and 5. All right, copy. Oh, you know what? Here's what I'm going to do. The denominators will be 3, 4, get over there, and 5. Okay, the numerators stay the same. 2 plus 1 minus 3. But for n equals 3, we're going to get 3, 4, 5. Okay? Scoot. I'm going to scoot this over to the right. Okay, so do you see what I see? Minus 3 over 3, plus 1 over 3, plus 2 over 3, those cancel each other out. Ooh, they're just zero. Something similar happened when we did the geometric series, the partial sums. Remember the r, r squared, r cubed, they all canceled out when we subtracted those two equations from each other. Something kind of similar is happening here, except we're adding the terms together. Okay, let's do a4. a sub 4 equals, this one will be 4, 5, 6. Okay, so I'm just going to take all of that, since I'm going to scoot it over to the right anyway. I want 4, 5, and 6. Okay, so scoot, scoot, scoot. These three, as we said, add up to zero. Hmm. But what about these three now? Minus three over four, plus one over four, plus two over four, that's also equal to zero. All right, so what's going on here? What's going on here? We now have a different way to compute S sub four. Okay, it is A1 through A4, plus blah, 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 plus, 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 a4, oh, that looks ugly, A1 plus A2 plus A3 plus A4. If it's not beautiful, it's not math. Okay, so we see that these cancel, these cancel, uh, these don't quite cancel. Uh, no, that doesn't cancel either. But what do we have surviving? In the first term, these survive. In the second term, this survives. Okay. And in the third term, uh, this gets canceled with these other two. These get canceled. So the only survivor in the third term is the minus three-fifths. And in the fourth term, the 2 over 4 survives, but the 1 fifths and the minus 3 6 survive. Okay, so these two don't completely cancel each other out. Okay? So now, let's imagine what's happening if we add more terms. Okay? If we, had an, if we actually added an A5, okay? What if we had one more term, a5, then we will scoot this to the right, and it will now be 2 over 5 plus 1 over 6 minus 3 over 7. Okay, and look what happens. The minus 3 fifths and the plus 1 fifths and the new 2 fifths from a5, those will now cancel out. Okay, so eventually these two will be joined by the two fifths and they all go away. Okay, but it comes with a price. The minus three six will now be joined by a plus one six and the minus three over seven. Okay, so there will always be three terms to the right over here, which we can of course, of course simplify. Okay, so what do we have so far? 
2, 1 half, and 2 over 2, those three terms will never go away. Okay, in fact, they are going to control what we get for our exact sum. Okay, so we have 2 plus 1 half plus 2 over 2. And then we have minus 3 plus 1 minus 2 over 5. Okay, so let's put the minus 2 over 5. And the last term will be minus 3 over 6. Okay, so in general, what's going to happen to Sn? The first three terms will always survive, but let's look at the pattern. When you have S4, these are 5 and 6, okay? So what's reasonable? When you have Sn, this will be n plus 1, and this will be n plus 2. Okay, so what is that? As n goes to infinity, 2 over n plus 1 goes to 0, 3 over n plus 2 also goes to 0. So the limit of this sequence is, of partial sums is going to be 2 plus 1 half plus 1, so that's 3.5. 3.5 plus 0 plus 0, okay? which is of course just 3.5. So let's verify. What were we getting as our partial sums earlier? We were getting, uh, check it out, 3.068, 3.45, and so on and so forth. Okay, so we were able to get the exact limit of our telescoping series, and we can conclude that our series converges to 3.5. There you go. Okay, so why is this called the telescoping series? If you've ever watched pirate movies or whatever, you know, they take these telescopes and then when they're finished, they just squish it together and you get something very, very short, okay? So in the same way, these are scooting over to the right, so you're going to get lots and lots and lots of terms, but when you add them together, you get a bunch of zeros, okay? So, you know, that's like the telescope, which is shrinking down to something very short, just like this, okay? So from uh, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, blah, 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 you get exactly five terms surviving once you simplify, and two of those terms have limit zero. The other three form the exact sum of your infinite series. All right, made it under an hour today. So uh, I hope you enjoyed that video. And next time, we're going to start with the tests that will determine whether an infinite series converges or diverges. So until then, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.